Now starting, all attendees are in listen-only mode. Good morning. This is Martha Calfee with the Tennessee Chapter of HFMA. We're um, pleased that you have joined us today uh, for the start of a, a fall series of the certification practicum that's uh, being presented uh, by Christoph Studer. Um, we uh, um, have parts of Region 5, uh, Region 4, Region 6, and parts of Region 7 all joining us for a total of 18 chapters, uh, as well as a few um, possibly from other chapters. So we welcome everyone and thank you for your participation. Uh, we hope that everyone who registered by um, the September 2nd date received their study material. And um, if not, then if you can um, send us an email, then we'll see where it is. Those that registered after that date, um, they should be there um, either yesterday or today. And uh, so anyway, with that, I'm going to hand it off to Christoph so that we don't take up any more time um, with logistics. If you have questions, I will mention one thing, questions, type them in your in the chat box and we will address those as we go through. So with that, Christoph, it's all yours. Martha, thank you very much and uh, hello everyone. I am um, speaking to you from Portland, Oregon today and uh, am delighted. This is the third time Martha, Brad and I are collaborating uh, on a, a webinar series and uh, we thought we had hit um, uh, a milestone when there were 10 participating chapters in the spring and now it's 18 so um, very happy to do this with you and uh, go through four two-hour intense sessions to prepare you for the CHFP exams. Now I just taught several live sessions last week one in California and three in New England. I have to say how um, much I personally prefer the live sessions because you can see me, I can see you, uh, there are no extraneous uh, interruptions, no people stepping into your office, no emails popping up on your computer, no uh, uh, phone calls, you can genuinely devote yourself to, uh, uh, to only the um, instruction uh, and, and the, the teaching. So I wish we could replicate that here, but we will certainly try. So what I would like to start out with right off the bat is to tell you about the exam itself uh, in, the, in a sort of almost a frequently asked question format. And I'll tell you where I get my information. Uh, on Friday, um, I taught a national webinar with uh, Diane Bleha from the New Hampshire chapter and uh, with Joe Abel from National HFMA. I talked about uh, an aspect of the curriculum, one that we will cover next week, uh, which is budgeting and forecasting. Diane talked about how to prepare for the exam, and then Joe spoke in general terms about what the exam is and what it is not. And so I, I thank I, I owe the remarks that I'm about to make to Joe, who I very greatly respect, uh, and he he guides the uh, certification pr program ably and wonderfully. So first of all, uh, what is the pass rate on the exam, uh, and uh, what's the desired pass rate, and what is the actual pass rate? This is a question that recently has uh, come up by several chapters. The uh, Board of Examiners, which uh, puts the exam together, uh, has uh, set a goal of a 60% first pass rate and a 90% second pass rate, that is a passing the exam on the second attempt. The actual pass rate right now is a little lower, it's 55%, but the second pass rate is upwards of 95%. So it's an exam that is clearly achievable, if not on the first try, then very clearly on the second try. Now what kind of an exam is it? It's a 150 question exam. It's, it's as Joe described it, a professional application exam. You are, uh, um, it's not a CPA exam. It's uh, uh, not nearly as long or as difficult as the CPA exam. It essentially tests your 
ability to apply the knowledge you already have or the as refined perhaps through the this the, through self study to uh, real life uh, um, uh, situations um, so it is a uh, it's a professional exam it's an assessment exam it uh, uh, is is one that Joel was very clear at pointing out is not something that reflects on your professional competency one one bit it is an exam that just tests your ability to answer 150 questions and get a, a 70 percent on answering those questions correctly it's not a reflection on your professional competency it's just an isolated aspect of of your life of of anyone's professional life so here is what Joel uh, advised the audience on Friday he says take the exam at face value don't read anything into the questions just take them as they are answer them the best you can he said the you you are in a way your worst enemy or we are in exams like this he says the, when people are tired or over worried uh, or fail to keep a, a sense of perspective, they don't do as well on an exam like this. He also stressed that it is okay to fail and that uh, when you learn, when you prepare for the exam, uh, you do the best or you learn the most when you're having fun. And he said that the learning experience does not have to be intense. So uh, take uh, uh, these uh, four webinars uh, more as an incentive, as an energizer to, um, for you to find your own pace in studying for this exam, be it uh, at five o'clock on a weekend morning, as some people do, or uh, a quiet moment at the end of the day uh, when you're waiting for uh, uh, to pick up a, a child at school or when you when a, a, a sports game little league game is about to start and you're sitting in the car and it's raining outside so uh, have fun with this and I'm going to try to make it fun for you as well and and make as many connections to the real world uh, um, with uh, with this curriculum as I possibly can. The exam itself is based on a field study that HFMA conducted uh, in 2010 when, it, when HFMA revised the exam and uh, that field study identified the chief uh, uh, learning objectives that an exam like this should contain and that blueprint has uh, been in place ever since uh, the exam is reviewed annually. There are, and, and, and I don't know this from Joel, but uh, it's something I picked up along the way. There is enough material, I believe, for maybe two exams. So the database is maybe 300 or so questions. So if you take the exam again, you're likely to see a different exam, even if it is only rearranged. You're not likely to recognize it as something you've done before. So um, the one thing that uh, the exam does not contain, and this is HFMA's goal this next year, is to add more information about the Accountable Care Act into it uh, and update the exam in that way uh, rather than uh, make a lot of changes to the fundamentals. Now also a question came up, how long do you have to wait? Uh, to retake the exam, the answer is 90 days and, and what uh, Joel described, uh, what he said in, in that regard is that he, he thinks in a way it's an act of kindness for uh, you to have to wait. He says people who don't pass and uh, um, try to rebound immediately and take the exam right away uh, uh, do worse than people who take time uh, reflect, uh, restudy some materials and then take the exam again. So I found all of this very reassuring and I pass this on to you to relay your own anxiety around an exam like this. Uh, it is definitely something achievable. Uh, what Joe also stressed, and again I've heard him say this before, the big three topics of the exam are the three that we are going to devote the first three webinars on, 
which are today's topic of financial reporting, next week's budgeting and forecasting, uh, followed by the revenue cycle. And then we um, uh, shoehorn the last three topics into the final webinar. The big three topics contain the the most quantitative uh, questions, they account for nearly 60% of the exam, so they're overweighted. And um, I, I personally feel that the last three topics, which are uh, internal controls, which encompasses compliance, uh, the next one, uh, uh, managed care and contracting, and the last one, disbursements, being questions that uh, you most easily can study on your own. Now, there is also an, uh, an HFMA um, self-study guide. Uh, think of this set of webinars as complementary to that self-study guide. If you have access to it, uh, it might uh, help to uh, use both of them side by side. Uh, the study guide costs $249. You subscribe to it uh, and, and read it online. It, the subscription is good for a year. At the end of that self-study guide is a sample exam. Um, it is not a predictor of uh, your ability to pass the actual exam. It is, uh, as Joe described, and it, uh, uh, meant to uh, introduce you to the experience and structure of the exam only. So you might find, if you indeed uh, choose to use the self-study guide, the HFMA self-study guide, which I don't think you need, but uh, if you want to, you can, and you get to that exam, don't uh, assume that that exam is going to uh, in any way look like the, the actual exam. Now, what I want to show you is uh, uh, one of the ways in which HFMA uh, gauges uh, the knowledge that healthcare financial managers ought to possess. Uh, the HLA competency directory is uh, is something that an organization called the Healthcare Leadership Alliance puts together, and you can Google this and download this HLA competency di directory yourself, which is what I did. I just highlighted the. Uh, uh, um, uh, HFMA as an association here, and if I show you what the other choices are, AACHE, ACMPE, AONE, that's the nursing organization, HFMA and HIMSS, and, and if I uh, look at ACHE and now look at what their competencies are when it comes to financial management, it's a similar list as the HFMA list, and it would look similar also for other organizations. So use this as a career building tool, if you will, uh, download this and, and see what's out there in, in terms of skills that uh, you can either check off and say, I already know these things, I do them well, or I could use some work in these areas. If you are in the latter category and say, I could uh, use some help, then I think you're at the right place to participate in these webinars and read the uh, accompanying uh, participant guide, because there's really nothing quite like this in my uh, experience out there uh, that uh, gives you this, other than the school of hard knocks working in the field and learning these things practically. If you are a CPA, in a way you already are quite attuned to a lot of these concepts, uh, but you don't work inside a provider organization, and this is really an exam that is uh, uh, takes the point of view of someone who works in an or, or provider organization. So even as a CPA, there are things you're not going to know that are going to be practical. Um, and uh, uh, if you have an MBA, you might know some of these things that are listed here in a very theoretical way but wouldn't necessarily know how they apply in, 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 real, in real life. And that also, in my opinion, goes for people who have a, a, an MHA, which can tend to also be quite theoretically theoretical and very strategy oriented and not necessarily at its very best when it comes to the financial piece. So that's, so I think uh, uh, certification really fills a need, it fills a niche, and uh, I, I hope that you will enjoy the experience uh, of going through this together. So where do we start? We're going to start 
start right off the bat with some questions. Uh, and Brad has set up some polling questions which you will need to answer to get uh, a CPE credit. And um, uh, what uh, he's going to show you is the first polling question and then immediately followed by the second. I'd like you to answer these questions uh, honestly and um, and then we'll talk about uh, the answers. So Brad is going to show us question number one. Actually, it's going to be Christ, Martha. Christ, Christoph, it's actually, yes. Martha, and that's you're the, the question. one who why, this. Why, Yes. Why did you sign up for the webinars? Is that the first one? Yes. Okay. It's a very blunt question, and I ask people this also in the uh, in-person in person uh, classes. The question is, why did you sign up for these webinars? And your selections are, um, I want to use a CHFP designation as a career building step. I want to confirm my health um, healthcare financial management skills. I want to fill in some gaps in my healthcare knowledge. I'm interested in learning in the learning experience in itself. And again, as Christoph mentioned, and I failed to mention the front, in order for you to receive your CPE credit for this one, you must answer the questions, uh, be it right or wrong. We don't look at that. Uh, we just need a, a, an answer from, from that. So if you'll make your selection, if you haven't voted, we'll leave it open for about 10 seconds and then we'll close it. And Martha, this is Brad. The other thing, uh, requirement to get the CP certificate for each session is to be connected to the webinar for a minimum of 90% of the duration. Very good. Thank you. Okay, we'll close that question and the share the results. And it's a mixed result. Um, about 40% said they want to use a CF a CHFP designation as a career career builder. Um, Nineteen percent was confirm healthcare financial management skills. Thirty six percent is to fill in the gaps in the healthcare knowledge, and the remaining was a, a learning experience itself. Thank you, audience, for uh, for your input on this. Uh, it's um, I I think. Uh, uh, let me just talk about uh, the various choices and, and what I read into your answers. Uh, the majority of you want to use the CHFP designation as a career builder. I am imagining you are the younger members in the audience. Hopefully you have three to five years of uh, management experience in a provider organization. This is really uh, what the uh, the exam is geared to so uh, and I uh, I have to say that the exam is indeed a career building step it's a landmark a milestone so to speak if you can pass this exam what in a way you are demonstrating to yourself and to your peers and to people in your organization including also if you provide professional services to your clients that you uh, want to differentiate yourself from from others. Now, nationally, about eight and a half percent of HFMA members are certified. So, out of uh, forty thousand uh, uh, members altogether, or thereabouts, this is a very, very selective group. It's a self-selected group. Uh, there are a lot of people who uh, perhaps aspire to this but don't have the discipline, don't have the drive to do this, uh, whereas you do. Uh, when I look back at a class I taught uh, at, an, at an ANI in the mid-1990s in Chicago, I found that list in my garage recently in a, in a banker's box. I was surprised how many of the names I now recognize, uh, people who took that class 20 years ago and now are leaders in, in, in our organization and in their field. So uh, I, I think that uh, you too, uh, very much uh, in doing this, show that, that you are going to be that next generation of leaders. So I'm, think, I'm glad, I think it's wonderful that you are in this class and you've made this decision. Now if you answered uh, B, I want to confirm my healthcare financial management skills. You're perhaps a, 
uh, someone who's been around the block who um, wants to just show that you know I have what it takes I know this stuff and um, I just want to uh, 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 say that I've done this, I've, I've climbed that mountain. So welcome to this class also. You are the uh, people that if we were in a live class would be the ones uh, with the best answers if I turn to you and uh, would provide the most seasoned uh, perspective on any of this material. Now if you answered C, I want to fill in some gaps in my healthcare knowledge, then you uh, would uh, be where I was when I started preparing this material uh, in a, in a very, on a very small scale for my own chapter in Oregon three years ago, um, I, had, I felt at the time that uh, my knowledge had depreciated over time. I wasn't as smart as I maybe once was uh, or as I thought I might be and uh, that I had neglected my professional development as a CPA. Of course, I had uh, maintain my license, but uh, there were a lot of things I just plain didn't know, or I could maybe describe in, in general terms, in vague terms, where uh, someone else in the know, in the field, would know what I was talking about, but I didn't feel I was very precise in my explanations or my grasp of the material. So I'm glad uh, that you're here as well because I think you will gain a lot from this class in connecting the dots and, and refreshing your skills. And then if you're interested in the learning experience in and of itself, then I, in a way, I admire you the most because you, um, you are not necessarily uh, motivated by a, a cost-benefit analysis here or, or think of everything in terms of goals and, and, and uh, tasks and, and so forth and just want to enjoy yourself and learn something and uh, you might uh, be the happiest group in, in, in all of us in all of us here to do this so thank you for your answer to the, uh, question number one I'm going to ask Martha now to go to question number two Okay, the second question is how, how committed are you to taking the CHFP exam? Um, the first one, or I am just about ready to take the CHFP exam now. I plan to take the exam soon after the last webinar. I'll take the exam eventually, just not sure when. I'm apprehensive about the exam and not sure it's for me. We've got about 95% voting with pretty much an overwhelming majority being um, that I plan to take the exam soon after the last webinar. Thank you, Martha. Thank you, uh, audience. Um, those of you who are ready for the exam, um, immediately ought to, I hope, uh, um, take the exam very, very quickly um, and uh, just be done with it. Uh, in, in hopefully what you will get out of uh, these webinars is, is just the final boost, the final chance to review what you already know so that you can sit down and take this exam. I had uh, one person in my class in uh, um, Southern California a week ago uh, Sunday and uh, this past weekend he already took the exam and passed it and he was uh, t telling me how ready he was and he would take it right away and bingo he did it. Uh, the 70% who answered that you want to take the exam soon I think are doing exactly the right thing. You're going to take this experience uh, get get out of it what you can and then not uh, let that knowledge uh, depreciate to use that word again and take the exam quickly. I uh, think that you will uh, find the exam 
quite uh, easy if you uh, don't wait. Now, the way the exam registration works, let me just tell you, uh, the exams are handled through a company called Castle International Testing Company, which has contracts with uh, colleges and university and testing centers, and the exam is administered on a computer. The way you sign up for it is through the HFMA website. Uh, you have to pull out your credit card before you can really uh, pick a site or a time. You pay $395 on your credit card, and then it opens up to you the locations and the available slots. Um, generally, you can uh, select uh, a place and a time convenient to you so though you basically prepay for the exam I don't think you will be disappointed in where you can take the exam and when it will be available for you. Then the, those of you who say you will take the exam eventually just not sure when I'm guessing you might be under a, a lot of time pressures maybe you have computer conversions going on or other deadlines or things going on in your family. I hope that uh, you will uh, be persuaded to uh, accelerate your taking the exam and do it soon after because it's a learning experience in and of itself and it is okay to fail. No one really knows about it other than you and retaking the exam which I once had to do many years ago is, is not uh, uh, at all such a terrible thing. Okay, and if you're apprehensive about the exam, then I uh, hope that what you get out of these webinars is that uh, that this stuff is learnable, it's doable, that uh, that you can do what I did with the CPA exam when I was ready to take it. I stopped studying a week before. I had a couple of massages and I decked myself out with lots of chocolate and candy. Walked into that exam and was in such a sugared zone that there's nothing that could have happened to me. Uh, uh, I was uh, totally relaxed in taking it and I hope that all of you would have a similar experience. Now I know we've spent quite a bit of time on preliminaries rather than on financial reporting and in a way we have the hardest topic ahead of us today which is ratios and financial analysis techniques but I hope that this introduction helped orient you and, and, and answer some of your questions and put your mind at ease uh, in what we're getting ourselves into and, and maybe also encourage you to close the door and to uh, really allow yourself, give yourself permission to enjoy this learning experience. As Joel said, you learn the most when you are having fun. Now when it comes to ratios, you might say, Christoph, you must be kidding because this stuff is not a lot of fun. And uh, you have a, a point there in that uh, ratio analysis is not necessarily is something that people uh, uh, tremendously enjoy, even if you are uh, a, um, a uh, uh, raider uh, who works for Moody's or Standard & Poor's, or you are a CFO who calculates ratios and has to explain them to uh, the finance uh, committee of the board and uh, to um, outside uh, stakeholders. Uh, and we rely so much on uh, pre-programmed formulas that we may not know exactly how to calculate these uh, formulas, these ratio formulas uh, uh, off the top of our head. And here they are. This is uh, start this the, the page I'm showing you is in your book. If you have the book, on page 26. So you might ask, where do these ratio formulas come from? Why is it this set of ratios and not any others? And you see I'm just leafing through them right now, paging through them here for you to show you what they are. There's 35 of them. Well, uh, many of you, particularly the Ohio members uh, on this webinar will know who Bill Cleverly is. Bill is a, a long-standing HFMA member from Columbus, Ohio, has uh, uh, taught healthcare finance. He's written uh, 
I think more than one textbook which has gone through multiple editions. Well, about 30, more than 30 years ago, Bill put together a pamphlet for HFMA and I wish I still had my copy. I lost it somewhere along the lines. It was called something like uh, Common Financial Ratios Used in Healthcare, the Healthcare Industry or something like that. And this is his set of ratios. These are the ones that Bill back then laid out as being meaningful for our industry. Um, and uh, so they are, and they are not the only ratios. They are not the only ways to define even a common ratio. And if you look at the Fitch or Thomson Reuters website or Moody's or Standard and Poor's, and uh, they care to show you the formulas or you Google the formulas, uh, the ratios, you might see other definitions of them, which just shows that there is an art to this. There is no, the answers are not black and white when it comes to how you analyze financial statements. So before we can look at these ratios and make a lot of sense of them, we have another hurdle to climb and that is that in uh, uh, that we uh, apply ratios to financial statements, which means that we have to uh, understand what a financial statement is in the first place. And uh, so we're going to spend a little bit of time on what a financial statement is. And this for many of you or some of you will be a, a tedious review, but for others, this will be uh, something you don't haven't done in a while, uh, maybe since school, since a finance class or an accounting class or an MBA class. So let's take a look at the uh, consolidated financial statements for HFMA Health System, which uh, are an actual uh, health system in the United States. These are their financial statements. I downloaded them through a Muni OS website where you have access, anyone has access to the, the filings of uh, uh, any organization, uh, not-for-profit organization that has public debt. So here we're looking at the consolidated statements of operation, statements plural, because it's a, a comparative years, it's two years, and we notice right away that uh, this financial statement follows the newest uh, guidelines uh, by the uh, uh, FASB, or the Financial Accounting Standards Board, uh, uh, in terms of financial statement uh, presentation in that operating revenues at the top, and I'll make this a little bit bigger for you, um, operating revenues are shown as net which uh, uh, they always are on financial statements, which means they have uh, contractual allowances, estimated contractual allowances already taken out of them. Uh, and uh, also in this case, having uh, uh, the provision for doubtful accounts or bad debt taken out of them. This is a new uh, format uh, until 2012. Uh, the provision of doubtful accounts, this line right here with the 290 million, these are in thousands, these numbers, was an operating expense down below. It has since moved up above and uh, is now a deduction from uh, net patient service revenues before the provision of doubtful accounts, as that line is called. That brings you down to the true net patient service revenues. Uh, uh, the next line is premium revenue, so HFMA Health System either operates a health plan, has its own health plan, which is indeed the case, or it uh, would accept capitation revenue, but then it probably wouldn't be called premium revenues, it would be called prepaid health care or capitation revenues. Um, then there is a line called other revenues, uh, which we're going to have to spend some time talking about, although it's a smaller number, as you can see, that gives you your total revenues. Follow that are operating expenses. You see what those lines are. They um, uh, are intuitive and make sense. And then you come to what uh, 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 some people refer to uh, kind of casually as the bottom line, which is uh, its uh, exact title would be called operating uh, income. It's this 330 million where my cursor is right now. The official title of it is excess of revenues over expenses from operations. So that's just uh, how uh, accountants uh, 
call it. If you want to know, by the way, this is a piece of professional advice to you, where uh, the rules for accountants or accounting are most accessible when it comes to healthcare. They are published in the AICPA uh, uh, Audit Guide for Healthcare Organizations. AICPA is the American Institute of CPAs in New York and they publish an audit guide. Costs about a hundred dollars. Uh, you can also download it as an ebook. If you don't have one on your shelf, I urge you to buy one or to even better ask your auditor for a complimentary copy. I'm sure your CPA firm would be happy to give you a comp a copy for it. It, uh, it uh, extracts from the uh, Financial Accounting Standards Board uh, um, um, rules, the, those that apply to healthcare in a very accessible format. It's a, a volume that belongs, I think, to every, on every healthcare financial manager's bookshelf. Okay, so that's the operating uh, income. That number is also called the performance indicator in the AICPA audit guide with a capital P and a capital I. It is by far the most important number in your financial statements. Uh, followed is a line called net non-operating gains. You see it right down below, $155 million. Those are um, your earnings from your investments in the form of interest, uh, dividends, capital gains, capital losses. Also in here, noteworthy, are um, uh, the restatement of investments that you have not sold but that have gained or lost value in the last year and this uh, uh, concept is called mark to market where you mark your investments either up or down to the market value at the balance sheet date which in this case would be uh, uh, December the 31st. Notice in this particular case with HFMA Health System that in 2010 uh, recovering from the Great Recession, though those net non-operating gains were much smaller than the year afterwards in 2011 when they rebounded very nicely. The two together add up to net or total income. Um, you That is a number sometimes used in ratios. Also, all three numbers appear in ratios in some form or another. That's why I'm pointing them out to you. Then following that is a reconciliation to net assets uh, in your financial statements and uh, the uh, change in net assets from year to year is called comprehensive income. That's something I don't think you need to know. For the exam, I'm just showing you that when you're talking about income, you have to be very precise in what, what it is you mean. Then below that, I have uh, um, pulled out some footnotes from the back of the financial statements and just simply put them on the face of the income statement here just simply to uh, highlight them. One is uh, a footnote that relates to this uh, other revenue number up here. We're going to come back to that, that in a moment. And then the other one is a functional uh, uh, classification of expenses. In other words, this 7.4 six billion number is broken down in a different way here. The above classification here is called the natural classification of expenses. Here we have a functional expense classification. Why, why is it important? Well, an external user is uh, uh, frequently interested in knowing how lean the organization is and how much it spends on general ad administrative expenses. You see it here. Those are typically fixed expenses. Uh, they are incurred regardless of volume. So you see we haven't done anything yet with uh, the with, uh, the ratios here on the right so far, but we're going to jump right in now and uh, start looking at these ratios here on the right. Notice that ratios fall into different uh, groups. There are profitability ratios. They do exactly what the name implies. Liquidity ratios um, give information about the ability of an organization to pay its uh, bills uh, in the short term and current in this case means one year. So that's how current is uh, defined. 
Oops, oh, shoot. My screen had just gone away. I hope that you are still seeing it. I don't know, I had an annoying box there which I wanted to go away. Hopefully we're fine. Okay, so moving right along here, uh, there's more liquidity ratios, then come capital structure ratios of greater interest to uh, in external uh, uh, stakeholders and investors. They um, give information about the ability of an organization, the likelihood of an organization to still be around years from now when the, the final installments of, of debt the money that the organization borrowed from creditors is due. Will the uh, will the organization be able to pay that back? Then come activity ratios, easy to learn, that uh, uh, denote the efficiency of a particular asset. And then, lastly, some utilization indicators, which were not part of uh, Bill Cleverly's original set of financial ratios, but which uh, you need to know for the exam because they give information about how uh, an organization, how busy an organization is, just like an airline reports on load factors, how uh, uh, many seats they fill of the airplanes. We have an occupancy rate right here, the ratio number 26, which does something like that with inpatient beds. So we'll talk about each of these in turn, but we're going to start Start with the operating margin right here. Here's the formula. It's total operating revenue, which is this number right here, 7.7 .7 million, minus operating expenses of 7.4, same as operating income. Here it is, 330 million, divided by uh, total uh, revenues. Uh, uh, and this particular organization has a pretty good operating margin of around 4%. That's actually pretty darn good. So that's the performance indicator uh, ratio that you are guaranteed to see on the exam. Now, what I'm going to also show you are the two pages that precede uh, the, the formulas. It's page 24 and 25. I'm going to make that larger here for you to see. Uh, where I kind of give you a, a map of the ratios. Uh, again, I, they're divided here into profitability, liquidity, capital structure ratios, etc. I'm giving you a, a pithy uh, shorthand uh, uh, serial box definition of each of the ratios. And then I am uh, sticking my neck out here to, to suggest which of these ratios are more important than others, the ones that say learn, uh, I think you should learn, uh, skip if you don't want to learn them all, those would be the ones to put at the back of the deck. And uh, then I'm also telling you where the information comes from, the income statement or statement of operations, which is its official name, or the balance sheets uh, denoted here, or a little bit of both. Then the last column here to the right tells you if a ratio that is increasing uh, um, is a good thing or if it is a bad thing. Um, if the column is blank in a particular row, it means that it depends that you can't uh, in a black and or white matter say that up is good or bad. So this is kind of the, the, the Google map, the, the uh, Google Earth view, the higher level view, and then until, and then you get into the actual formulas right here. So having already done the operating margin, um, uh, let's see what some of the other um, ratios here are that we may want to pay attention to. And I want to particularly turn your attention to ratio number six and ratio number seven, return on total assets, which is net income, this number right here for almost five, uh, $500 million divided by total assets on the balance sheet or return on equity, which takes net income and divides it by net assets. Net assets being the smaller of the number net assets also sometimes called erroneously uh, equity. And you see that the title here really should be return on net assets. Uh, uh, but uh, when this was put together, it was, I think, still called equity. Equity is, uh, uh, is what uh, uh, for-profit uh, companies have, including for-profit healthcare organizations. Net assets is what the rest of us, the, the not-for-profits, not call uh, equity. Okay, so moving 
moving along here, let's look at the balance sheet since, uh, since these ratios use the balance sheet, the ratio six and seven. Here are the, uh, here's the left side of the balance sheet with current assets. Uh, let's just quickly walk through them. Note, I noticed that I pulled forward uh, a footnote, footnote five with accumulated depreciation. So you can see what, what that is. So there's some cash. There's management designated investments that are like cash. They have just been earmarked for uh, 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 something else right now, uh, but easily could be converted to cash. And uh, uh, the, uh, a large number here, the biggest one is accounts receivable. Um, that is uh, net of allowance for bad debts. Again, just like revenue is stated at net realizable value, in other words, net revenue ought to equal cash, uh, accounts receivable ought to equal cash as well, money that you intend to collect. Now charity is uh, removed from that number just like charity also does not show up in revenue. And why is that? Well, charity uh, care is uh, revenue that we never intended to collect because of the patient's inability to pay. So we don't count it at, at all as revenue. We zero out the accounts in the business office. We write them off to charity and they're zero. And so they show up in accounts receivable at zero. They show up in revenue at, at zero as well. Uh, then we have some other things, including supplies. All of this is our current assets that are uh, uh, realizable within a year. Then we have a very large number here, uh, a bunch of cash that the organization has earmarked for even longer term uh, uses than this number up above here. And uh, you know, an, ar an argument could be made that this is uh, uh, cash that the organization could easily undesignate and, and spend for operations if they needed to. It, it, might uh, represent uh, a, a, a little a nest egg here to buy physician practices, to buy a smaller competitor, to install an epic computer system, what have you. But uh, those things don't need to happen if the organization really needed the money. And that, that's relevant to the calculation of one of the ratios later on. Then we have property, plant, and equipment. That is the book value of our bricks and mortar does not include our intellectual property, which is not put, which is not quantified and recorded, unfortunately, in our financial statements. So that's the asset side. Moving along to the liability side, we have the, the typical candidates we see in uh, current liabilities, including the current portion of long-term debt, this is what uh, we need to repay in principle this year. We move it up from this number down here. This is the long-term debt net of current portion. So we've uh, moved part of it up here because we need to pay it this year. Then we have a concert payable, accrued compensation, which could be a PTO, bonuses, uh, uh, a timing difference because December 31st fell in the middle of the pay period, various reasons. Then we have a number here payable to contractual agencies, which we will talk about in the fourth webinar when we look at the cost report and the do to and do to do from uh, uh, box on the cost report. So stay tuned on what that number is. Um, and then we have some other stuff going on and then we have net assets. Okay, before we move on, we're going to have to talk about what net assets are. You know, over here on the right, we use net assets in the return on equity. So since uh, the uh, net assets number, here it is, is a smaller number than uh, total assets, uh, total assets being 9.5 billion, the same as uh, 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 liabilities and net assets on the right side, uh, the result for the return on assets is going to be a higher number than uh, the return on equity, I'm sorry, is going to be a higher value than the return on total assets. But they're all three numbers, the operating margin, the return on total assets, and the return on equity will probably move in the same direction. If you have a positive operating margin, you will also have a positive return on total assets or return on equity. Let's look at the 
details of what is in net assets. First of all, there is a, the largest line here is unrestricted net assets. So what is that? In a for-profit organization, this would be called uh, accumulated uh, earnings or something of the sort. It's essentially uh, composed of what the organization started with on day one. Uh, when it was given a building and uh, some cash and had no liabilities, uh, it would have uh, net assets equal to the value or the book value of what, what it was given uh, on day one. And it added to that would be all of the earnings uh, over time minus all of the losses over time. So it's a deeply historical number. It also uh, uh, contains some other things that we're going to talk about in a minute. Ah, what it contains, I'll tell you right now, are also donations. It's not just income, it's not just accumulated earnings, but it is also unrestricted donations, money that the foundation or, or generous donors have given the organization. Now, donors can do three different things when they make a gift to a not-for-profit organization. They can uh, attach no strings to their gift, in which case the organization puts it, uh, puts the money in the bank, the cash goes in the bank, and that's, that's on the asset side and on the liabilities side, it records an equal amount in unrestricted net assets. So it adds that to its accumulated earnings. Now a donor can also temporarily restrict a gift and say, I want you to build a, a, a new medical center and put my name on the door. That would be a temporarily restricted gift. As soon as the building is up and the, the ribbon is cut, uh, that gift moves from temporarily restricted to unrestricted. The restriction has been lifted. So what are the accounting entries? Uh, the accounting entries in that case would be that the, the, the cash which uh, sits up here goes away, it's spent, and uh, the building uh, instead gets uh, uh, moved or the cash gets shown on the balance sheet as property plant and equipment and on the liability side on the right side it would move the gift would move from here to here so there's no income statement effect of a, a, a gift that's given for a building project it's uh, uh, simply moved on the balance sheet from one box to another now a gift can also be uh, for operations uh, it could be uh, a gift for cancer screening, it could be a gift for uh, uh, free care for a particular constituency. Those gifts might also be uh, uh, temporarily restricted until and the restriction lifted uh, when, the, when the money is spent. So where does that go? Well, there's cash here. So the cash goes away. Um, and it is uh, it is spent on operations, but, but it is also included in in income. So the as that money is spent, as that money is spent on the uh, purpose of the uh, the donation, it is recognized up here under other revenues as revenue, and then the expenses would show up here somewhere in any one of these boxes. So some gifts have. Uh, 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 go run through the income statement and gifts for operations do that. They run through this number up above here. And that's what this footnote down here that I, I pulled forward basically does. It says that out of that $440 million in this other revenues line, uh, you know, 33 million was uh, those kinds of gifts. And, and those gifts then also on the balance sheet go from temporarily restricted into unrestricted. So those kinds of gifts go through the income statement. Then permanently restricted gifts, and I only talk about all of this because you're likely to be asked about it on the exam, permanently restricted gifts are essentially endowment funds that uh, you can't spend uh, the corpus of the, the principal, you can only spend and the income of it, and those will stay permanently restricted gifts, basically, uh, forever. So that's uh, uh, what happens. Now, 
let's talk about the gifts that uh, bypass the income statement. Let's say the medical center gets built and uh, it now sits here in uh, property, plant and equipment. Every year this new building is going to be depreciated and depreciation shows up on the uh, income statement. Here it is as a line here it is depreciation so the, the 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 building like any other asset is going to be depreciated and run through the income statement in little bits and pieces depending uh, uh, on the life expectancy of that asset the useful economic life of the asset so even though a, a gift for an entire new hospital with with your name on it bypasses the income statement when it is built eventually it is going to be depreciated through the income statement <coughs> pardon me and in a way that uh, um, net asset uh, you know the, uh, where that hospital building now sits that's going to gradually erode or go away because uh, of depreciation so that's just a little wrinkle <coughs> about healthcare so I think we have talked about enough of the financial statements to uh, go and look at some more ratios here at right. So what uh, else uh, should we look at? Current ratio. The current ratio um, uh, um, is broadly defined as current assets divided by current liabilities. You will remember that ratio easily. Now if you look at at that number here and uh, apply it, apply that ratio formula to HFMA health system. You see that uh, current assets are 2.3 billion, current liabilities 1.8. So you don't get a real high uh, current asset ratio here. Current ratio here, the organization doesn't appear to have as much cash as as you may think it prudent for it to have current ratios ought to be two ideally two or higher in other words you can pay all of your current liabilities twice over that's kind of a rule of thumb uh, why is this not a problem in this particular case I think the reason for that is that HFMA health system has so much money parked here and here okay although this down here is a long-term <clears throat> asset uh, and you wouldn't include it in this current ratio calculation. As I said a little while ago, this money is only a, a, a one decision by the board away from being turned back into, into cash. Okay, then there are some other uh, <clears throat> ratios that measure liquidity that are more restrictive that take uh, out of current assets those things that are not so easily turned into cash. So the quick ratio is one of them and if you ask yourself what is it that's missing here that's included up above in current in the current ratio one of them would be supplies. This one right here. Why? Because uh, you don't typically sell your supplies back to your vendor uh, if you're trying to pay bills. You, uh, you need your supplies for operations so it's not really a, a, an asset that is that in the normal course of business you would uh, liquidate. Uh, then a couple, they here on this next page of formulas there are a couple of ratios which uh, you will need to know very well and uh, they are ratio 11 and ratio 13. You see I have liberally annotated uh, Bill Cleverly's uh, list of ratios without his permission I, I have to say but uh, I'm just trying to help uh, you help myself in when I wrote this to understand what is going on so net days in patient accounts receivable is net uh, uh, patient accounts receivable divided by patient average daily revenue that's what this uh, 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 denominator here is average daily revenue it's uh, the annual revenues from the financial statements divided by 365 now in in operating uh, reports uh, this is not how a hospital would do it they would uh, take say three months worth of revenue 
and divide it by 90 or 91 or 92, however many days are in that three month period. Why? Because uh, revenues fluctuate, they might fluctuate seasonally or uh, for other reasons and uh, you don't really want to, you want a more dynamic measure of days than you get uh, by doing this once a year by taking such a large denominator. Um, but uh, a financial system user who only has an external user who only has it available to them the audited financial statements would have to do it this way and take a whole year's worth of net patient service revenue and divide by 365. There's cash on hand, another important uh, uh, ratio because it uh, <clears throat> may be um, uh, a requirement in, in a bond covenant to uh, for an organization to may, maintain a certain liquidity, days cash on hand measures your ability to uh, hold your breath underwater. How many days can you operate n normally with normal operations without collecting another dime from your accounts receivable? So that is the days cash on hand. Uh, formula uh, depreciation here in the in the denominator is removed because depreciation you will remember this from your accounting 101 class is a non-cash expense so converting your operating expenses I'm going to go back to showing you the uh, financial statements here if you wanted to convert your operating expenses, which is this number right here. If you wanted to, uh, um, in an easy way, convert that to how many dollars of cash went out the door, um, you would take that number and add back this depreciation number because it's a non-cash expense. It's an allocation of past uh, capital purchases to the current accounting period. So that's how, that's all there really is to say about uh, liquidity ratios and uh, let's move on in that case to the capital structure ratios and if we were doing this in a live scenario this would be a lot more fun than uh, you wouldn't just be listening to me talking I would be asking you lots and lots of questions. Now capital structure ratios those are the ratios that Wall Street would be interested in mostly uh, 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 ratios here that are important uh, you can see from the, that earlier list here which ones I say to learn or skip. I will just point out a few of them. Uh, the <clears throat> equity financing ratios would uh, tell you how much of uh, an organization's assets are actually owned by it, free and clear. And uh, um, let's see if that's a ratio that uh, has a up is good or up is bad value and notice that there's nothing here in the right where my cursor is the equity finance ratio which measures how much of a balance sheet is owned versus finance through credit and debt. So there is a sweet spot for organizations in this ratio. Uh, you don't want to be over leveraged in, and have a <coughs> A very low value here, so where you owe most of uh, uh, your assets to uh, outsiders, um, you don't want to be over leveraged by having uh, uh, so much debt, but you also don't want to be under leveraged in that you um, don't put your net assets to work in in operations sufficiently or for strategic uh, reasons. So there is no right answer to this, uh, although there are probably some guideposts that the rating agencies do set. Uh, then uh, here's another ratio, number 16, long-term liabilities divided by net assets. Uh, times interest earned is a, or cash flow to debt. These are also important ratios that frequently show up in bond covenants and then debt to capitalization here. Now debt to capitalization differs from uh, long-term debt to equity in that uh, the uh, debt in ratio 20 here also shows up in the denominator. What that means is that this ratio right here I'm circling can never exceed, it, it, it can never reach a one. 
uh, it will always be below a one, whereas uh, long-term debt to equity can reach values that are higher than one. So I think it's probably time to do some polling questions again, and we're going to do several of them here in a row. If you uh, don't do well on these questions, don't worry. These are materials that uh, I've gone over very, very quickly, and uh, they will require more time f uh, by you to study them. So, uh, Martha, would you show us the next polling question, number three, please? The question is, financial statements include statements of changes in operations and net assets, statements of changes in net assets and equity, footnote disclosure to the cost to charge ratio, and footnote disclosure of charity care at cost. And again, um, to answer, answer the question, we don't look for right or wrong, but if you're needing CPE for the, uh, for the course, uh, for this session, you will need to, to at least answer the question in some form. And Christoph, once we get through with the polling questions, we've got a couple other questions that we can try to tackle before uh, we hit the next topic. Yes, let's do that right after this polling question. Be careful in how you read the question. Take it at face value. Uh, as Joel said in the webinar on Friday, um, and if if um, the the choice is confusing, then it probably is confusing. So uh, don't try to go behind the question and, and interpret something into it. If something doesn't make sense, it could be that the qu uh, question writer is, is trying to mislead you, and what that tells you is that's not going to be the right answer. Okay, I, we've got about 90% yes. um, voted, so if you've not voted, then I'm going to close it in about 10 seconds. Okay. All right. Okay. Um, the, so I wrote this question myself. Yeah, go ahead, Martha. The 65% said statements of changes in operations and net assets. 26% is a statement of change in net assets and equity. Thank you. I, I, uh, I wrote this question myself, so this is uh, not a, not one of these questions are board of examiner questions because I, like you, don't have access to what they actually ask. So I'm, I think I did a good job in confusing you here because look, there's a statement of changes in net assets which is what this is, but there is no such thing as a statement of changes in operations. Mm -hmm. So what is actually the right answer? The right answer is D, and 8% of you got that one right. Uh, a charity care is uh, uh, disclosed in a footnote in the financial statements. Uh, right here it is, footnote I, which uh, I uh, ex excerpted from all of the footnotes to these financial statements. So that's where it would be, it would be uh, recorded at cost, um, at cost, okay, using a cost to charge ratio from the cost report. So um, since uh, charity care is not revenue, the only way to measure it is through cost and it is a footnote disclosure. So that is the right answer. Now, why is B not the right answer? Statement of changes in net assets uh, and equity. That again is uh, doubling up. There's no such thing as a statement of changes in net assets and equity. Net assets is equity. So again, I, I uh, must have done a pretty good job there confusing you. The right answer is, as I said, is D. So I want to pause here and allow you to uh, ask uh, some questions of me. Okay, the, one of the questions uh, was what percentage of the um, exam deals with the ratios? Okay, uh, hard to say. Uh, I think you could probably ace the exam, pass the exam with, while skipping every single ratio question uh, uh, that, that's thrown at you. I would say 
10 to 15 questions would be racial questions. In other words, uh, uh, you know, maybe 7 to 10 percent of the exam could be racial questions, financial statement questions. So, you know, you could argue that, uh, uh, Christoph, you're uh, uh, wasting my time. I don't really need these. I don't think you can. I would not advise that as a strategy that you not know what ratios are. Just think about it. Uh, this is a, a, an assessment exam. It assesses your ability as a financial healthcare financial manager, and this needs to be in your toolkit. You need to know how a financial statement works. You need to be able to memorize these formulas and then apply them to some financial statements on the exam that are going to look a lot simpler than what I'm showing you here. You're not going to see a financial statement with as many lines as these HFMA health system financial statements, but they will have just enough lines uh, for you to have to make some decisions as to where you're going to get your information, and then you're going to have to calculate the ratios and pick the right answer. And I advise you to bring a calculator. Okay. Um, one of the other questions um, that uh, somewhat relates to that was, are there several questions that are multiple parts that depend upon the same data set? Yes. The answer is yes. So there could be a set of financial statements, like I said, sim sim uh, significantly simplified from these. And then there could be, say, five or six questions on that set of financial statements. You would also see that uh, uh, next week in uh, when we talk about budgeting and forecasting. Those would be the two sections on the exam where you have a data set uh, applying to multiple questions. Okay, the other question related to the last section I think you were talking about and um, Mark asked the question, do you have an amount for under leveraged or a range? Wow, I would love to ask you of that uh, and uh, I know there are a number of CFOs in the audience. Would you please uh, uh, type your uh, answer to Mark's question into the into the chat area and then Martha when you see some answers read them please and we'll talk about them. Okay. I would say uh, I offhand I would say 50 percent that's that's the number that I would give but I I'm not close enough to this to know uh, if that's a good answer or not. Okay and then the other question that I've seen a couple of times is I think you mentioned a book early on and, uh, and they were asking for the title of that book. Again. Oh yes, yes, let me repeat that. It's the AICPA Audit Guide for Healthcare Organizations. AICPA Audit Guide for Healthcare Organizations. Okay. You can find that uh, on Amazon or the AICPA website or better yet through a phone call through your auditor. Right. Some of the a couple question a couple answers that we got on the un, under leveraged range. One person mentioned fifty two percent. Oh, um, so and that's the only answer that we've got there. Oh, thank you. I appreciate and that. Another one was they are allowed to bring calculators. One person says that they had taken it twice and didn't think you could have a calculator, but oh, I thought that, you could too. Yes, you can. And if that happens to you, uh, 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 you know, protest that and, and, and say, no, that is not true. And would they please uh, uh, call uh, uh, their, uh, you know, their manager or whatever, uh, or call HFMA and, and verify that you can bring a calculator. Uh, I've heard this also, and the exam uh, proctor may just not know that. They administer so many different exams. They, they may overlook that. It, it should be in the instructions that the proctor gets from HFMA. Now there is a, a calculator built into the software, the testing software. It's a tiny little thing. It's uh, 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 very difficult to handle with your mouse uh, because the display and the numeric key 
notepad is so small, don't do that. Uh, bring your own calculator and challenge uh, the uh, proctor on that. It doesn't matter whether you have a fancy or a simple calculator. That's not going to make a difference uh, in, in the, on the exam. Okay. I think that's most of them, and most of the percentages that I'm seeing coming in are between 35 and 60, um, and with 50 being kind of the, the middle of the pack. Oh, very good. Thank you very much for for helping helping each other out on this. So we're um, back to the polling questions. We're going to do the next polling question, please. Okay. Question uh, number four. Gifts to a hospital uh, from the foundation, is that it? Mm -hmm. Gifts to a gifts gifts to a hospital from its foundation are always recognized as revenue, never recognized as revenue, sometimes recognized as revenue and sometimes not, and their total equity turnover. Yeah, that is a mistake. I apologize for it. That D shouldn't appear there. So okay. any of you who voted D immediately take that take your take your answer back. There, that's that that was an answer to a different question. Okay, so always so recognized, never recognized, sometimes recognized. Yep, that's it. Okay, we've got about 75% um, have voted. Uh, I'll get leave it open just a, a few more seconds. Okay, the results are that 63% says sometimes recognized, 22 said always, and 14 said never. Yes, uh, C is the right answer. Um, as I said earlier, if it's a gift for uh, if it's a gift uh, for a capital project like uh, a wing of a hospital or we are, that would be. Um, recognized, not recognized as revenue, but gifts for operations would be recognized uh, as revenue. Then let's talk briefly, since this is a, a little bit confusing. Remember, there's this other revenues line up here, and then there is, that's also sometimes called, called other operating revenue. You see the word operating. So this line is sometimes called other operating revenues, as distinguished from non-operating gains or non-operating revenues here. And then, uh, of course, you have operating, uh, uh, you know, you have operating revenues. So you have operating revenues, other operating revenues, and non-operating revenues or gains in this case. So um, we know what this one is here, the non-operating, that's investments, and we're going to see another polling question on that here in a moment. We know what operating revenues are, patient service revenues, etc. But we haven't explored enough what other operating what other operating revenues are. We know part of this are gifts. We saw that in the footnote here down below. But what is the rest of it or the bulk of it? Would be a medical office uh, building MOB revenue, rent that doctors pay. It would be a parking lot, cafeteria, revenue, anything that's not uh, patient service revenue or premium revenue. It could also include grants. If you're a university medical center, research center, there would be grants in there. It's just so you are clear what that is. So yes, so sometimes the gifts are recognized as revenue and sometimes they're, they are not. Then let's do uh, one more polling question, then we'll move on in the discussion and do some more polling questions towards the end. Martha, the next one is polling question number five. Okay, when trading securities are marked? Yep. Yes. Okay, when trading securities are marked to market, its unrealized gains plus losses are included uh, in non-operating income. Realized gains and losses are included in non-operating income. Unrealized gains and losses are included in net assets. And while you're voting on that, Christoph, we've had several people say they've not been allowed to use calculators. There was functions that it had to be a simple calculator. So I think we'll need to check uh, with National on that 
and yes. maybe we can try to um, give out that information again next week. Yes. I, my suggestion on that one is, uh, you know, you all, we all have calculators that we got from our bank or, you know, savings and loan. When we opened an account, uh, we have, you know, little simple calculators. That's the kind of device I would bring. Uh, you know, a financial calculator would also allow you to program net present, you know, present value calculations in there. Uh, but you don't need anything that sophisticated on the exam period. Yeah. You just don't. But bring you bring one and insist that you can use it. Okay. The um, question I'm going to close for polling purposes. And the results are 44% um, said unrealized gains and losses are included in non-operating income. 36% said realized gains and losses are included on operating income, and 20% said unrealized gains and losses are included in net assets. Yes, uh, the um, uh, A is correct, and most of you got that one right. You have to read the question carefully. It says when trading securities are marked to market. What marked to market means is that you are adjusting for uh, uh, unrealized gains and losses. It has nothing, B is right, realized gains and losses are included in non-operating revenue, but that's not the answer to the question. The question is what, how are, uh, what, what is involved when trading securities are marked to market? You're always talking about unrealized gains and losses and doing something with them and you are including that in non-operating revenue or income, yes. So that's the right answer, and I think we should move on to the next uh, uh, topic. But I think I want to just humor you a little bit here before we move on. You know, there are a lot of certification programs in this world, um, and I did a little survey here to show you what are the things you can get certified in. You can get certified uh, here by the National Resume Writers Association case you want to be a resume writer. You can also uh, take a polygraph uh, uh, licensing exam or if you are into uh, shredding a uh, paper you can become certified in that and uh, the Colorado Funeral Board also has a certification. So uh, uh, lastly, the uh, American Cheese Society can certify you as a as certified cheese professional. Okay, so again, this is meant to show you that there's a life uh, uh, outside of this world of certification. Okay, where are we going to go next? Uh, I'll show you this one later. Uh, we're going to go back to our f f f f ratios. Here we go, our ratio formulas, and uh, continue looking at those. Activity ratios are simple. Uh, they always put uh, um, operating revenue in the numerator, and then they have a different type of asset in the denominator. Total assets, fixed assets, current assets, or inventory. Let's uh, now look at some uh, actual values of HFMA health system. Here we go. So this is a spreadsheet that uh, contains all the answers to the ratios. Every, virtually every ratio for HFMA health system is uh, calculated for you here. And if you want to know where this is in your book, first of all, let's talk about the organization of your book. And uh, most of you will have the book. Others will hopefully get it soon. There is a tab called pre-readings. Uh, about 200 pages that uh, contains kind of the textbook material to the, this practicum. The next tab are the overheads, the slides. We And notice we haven't looked at a single one of these. Um, I uh, don't, uh, rarely use them anymore in these webinars because we have so much material to cover. And then uh, there are all the case studies um, for this entire eight hours of class time, followed by the answers to the uh, case studies. And the spreadsheet I'm showing you right now starts on page 360. OK. 
Okay, so these are actually the values uh, that you would calculate if you uh, um, did this case study uh, as part of uh, your learning, your preparation. What I do in a live class is I divide the class into CFOs and uh, uh, rating agency professionals uh, arbitrarily by just going right down the middle and I tell the CFOs to pick the ratios that are most meaningful to them in, a, in a, a reviewing or analyzing the financial performance of their organization and then I ask the rating people to look at uh, the financial statements through the eyes of a, a rating agency and then we talk about the choices that each group made and, and also their the results of their calculations. So here is the here are the answers, and uh, let's just go go through these quickly. I think this will help you understand the ratios if we look at the answers. And uh, of course, on the exam, you all you will have are the raw data and then the the ratio name. You're not going to have a spreadsheet like this. You're not going to be given the formula. So this is here only for for learning purposes. Where the uh, screen is in orange, um, we're looking at ratios where the change in um, the accounting standard that moved a bad debt expense from the expense side to the uh, deduction from revenue up higher above uh, makes a difference to the ratio. And you see there are several ratios that have affected by this here, some more on the next page. So uh, an accounting change like that also affects the ratios, which means they are then not quite co comparable from year to year, and uh, that uh, difference somehow needs to be taken into account maybe by calculating them both ways. So what we have here are, uh, we'll go straight to the operating margin, which is the performance indicator ratio number three. You see HFMA Health System, quite profitable in both years, a slight decline in the second year. Non-operating gains, uh, not that important a ratio, but one worth looking at in this context. What you're taking is the the, the non-operating gains, which including the mark mark to market securities, which we just talked about in the polling question, and you uh, divide those by total net income, and you see that in year 2010, 10% of total net income came from uh, uh, non-operating gains, probably because there were a lot of losses embedded in that number, whereas the next year, uh, the non-operating gains bounced back and accounted for a third of to total net income. Again, there's no right answer here. An organization that uh, has a very strong foundation and, and very strong cash performance or earnings performance and thus uh, uh, lots of investments is going to look very good. An organization that doesn't is not going to look so good, but that doesn't make uh, uh, one organization necessarily better than the other. Okay, so and you see here in ratios number six and seven how uh, the return on equity or net assets is much higher than the return on total assets because you're dividing by a much smaller number, 5 billion compared to almost 10 billion here. Uh, however, you see that these numbers move in the same, uh, you know, they, they're they they're positive. If, if operating margin is positive, these numbers will be positive too. Although you see they don't always move in the same direction. Operating margin decline, but return on total assets and return on equity actually went up. So you really have to take those three numbers together. Current ratio you see is very low, but we talked about how much cash the organization really has. These other ratios are also kind of low and possibly alarming, but not really. Net days uh, in patient accounts receivable is also affected by net patient service revenue, because in one case that uh, uh, has a bad debt in it, in the other case it doesn't. So moving along average payment period, uh, it looks like the, this organization, HFMA, uh, health system takes quite a long time to pay its bills, but probably 
these numbers are not quite true. I doubt that uh, the health system that is this uh, profitable and well managed would uh, hold out its vendors that long and not pay its bill basically for three months. So days cash on hand, very, very strong performance. But why is it so strong? Because it has uh, the, uh, these long term. Um, designated investments included here as cash uh, on the exam you would not want to do that but then I don't think the exam would confuse you by saying do you want to or not want to include it the answer would very much depend on management's intent and also the auditors understanding uh, of what uh, what this money really is so some auditors would say yes count it in your day's cash on hand this this large number here this large number here others would say no don't and uh, you know that materially affects the day's cash on hand okay capital hey, structure ratios Yes, Martha. We have a couple questions before you move on to that one. One question was, yes. do we learn the old way with respect to the bad debts on the ratio for the current exam? I would learn the new way. I okay. wouldn't have said that a year ago, but I, I would say that now. Okay, and there was another one. For the first ratio, where can I find the gross revenues? That should yes. be off the financials. Let's yes, say. it should. You're absolutely right. And um, the financials that I showed you uh, in the front of the book and that I displayed, you know what I'm talking about, these uh, financial statements are also reproduced in the back of the book in the case study section. And uh, given that the ratio requires you to know what gross revenue is, the financial statements in the back actually tell you what it is and I'm referring to page 266. You will see it there. You will also see on page 266 other information that you need to do the um, uh, utilization indicators. It's the bottom of page 266 in your book. But uh, thank you for that question and, and, and your alertness in, in noticing that that information is not in the front of the book. Okay, I think that was all for right now. Okay, super. Then I'm going to go back to the calculations another time. Here we go. Okay, so capital structure ratios. Notice here, you know, I asked you what you think is a, a, a good equity financing ratio. Well, you see here what it is for HFMA Health System. It's slightly over 50%. And uh, this is a highly rated healthcare system, so the uh, rating agents seem to be comfortable with that much leverage. Okay, so pay uh, particular uh, uh, attention to the numbers for ratio 16 and ratio 20 because the last polling question, if we get to it today, uh, will ask you to calculate ratio 16 and 20. And this is a little bit confusing. The uh, long-term debt to equity ratio right here, I'm going to have to do display these side by side so you can see what I what it is I'm doing. I know the display on the right is very small. I'm going to try to make it as big as I can so you can see what I'm doing. Hopefully this is still going to work. Yeah, the long-term debt to equity ratio number 16 takes uh, uh, a long-term debt which is on the here it is long-term debt this number here it adds to it other long-term liabilities because together that is uh, long-term liabilities. It's essentially long-term liabilities just like the name implies divided by net assets. Okay, that's the calculation here. So the calculation for ratio 20 which is the debt capitalization ratio I'm using somewhat different numbers here. I'm using again the current the, the long-term debt this number here. Here it is. I'm also, since it's total debt, adding the uh, current portion of long-term debt, this number here. And then I'm adding another number here that is specific to these financial statements. You wouldn't see this on a simplified financial statement on the exam. You see there's another item here that has the word debt in it, master trust debt 
classified as short-term. So that's all of the debt up here. And then in the number in the denominator, I, it's uh, it's the the long-term debt again here. It's the total of uh, this number is the total of of the the two current portions. And then I have net assets and and, and just look at the answer. Here it's fifty percent. Here it's thirty percent. I told you earlier that this number down here can never reach a one. Always going to be less because you have total debt in both the numerator and the denominator. Whereas this number right here can go higher to show you uh, that relationship a little bit uh, more clearly. This is the cover of your book. I'm going to fast forward to a page, this page here, it's page 31 in your book, um, where I give you an example of how these numbers actually work when you are uh, calculating the long-term debt to equity, uh, which is ratio 16, and debt capitalization ratio, which is ratio 20. Notice that the first ratio is always higher than the second and can take on quite extreme values here of a four that would be a hugely leveraged uh, and dangerously leveraged organization. Um, and the, the one that uh, um, HFMA health system is going to be up here. They're going to be a 0.5 and a 0.33. So you see they're quite conservative in that regard. Okay, where else do we go? I'm still looking at the calculations here. Here we go. Uh, moving on now to the uh, asset efficiency ratios, the activity ratios. Again, these numbers are in orange because operating revenue changes with that uh, change in accounting rules in 2012. And just notice what you're seeing here. Essentially, what is an asset terminal? What are any of these ratios really telling you? They're essentially telling you how many times over in a year they uh, um, turn their assets into revenue. They employ their assets in generating revenue. And uh, for total assets, you see it's not quite a one. And I don't know uh, what this would be in other industries. It, 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 there could be industries that are not so heavy in bricks and mortar uh, investments or assets as hospitals that have a higher asset turnover. I'm thinking maybe the high tech industry or maybe uh, Facebook or Twitter or so. Um, I'm not sure. Uh, and then other industries like uh, coal mine or uh, so that ha you know has very high investments would have a possibly a lower asset turnover. Just not sure. And fixed assets is higher. Current assets higher yet. Makes sense because you're dividing by a smaller number. Now this next one I want to point out to you because I think this one is interesting. Now, do you really believe that um, a hospital's inventory turns over 63 times a year? No, of course it doesn't. It turns all over maybe once a month or maybe 12 times a year. So why does this ratio calculate out to such an enormous inventory turn? It's because you're taking your inventory number, which is a small number in healthcare. We don't make anything, we produce health, and we use supplies in the provision of healthcare services. So inventory is going to be a small number compared to a manufacturing organization, but we're dividing it into total operating revenue, a very, very large number, you know, eight almost 8 billion. Now, if we divided it into the inventory, say, into surgery revenue, we might come off with a more realistic and real life answer here, but an external user of a financial statement would not know that and thus uh, not be able to calculate it. Then now we come to utilization indicators, the last set of ratios here. You see the formulas here, and these are significant enough to merit you learning them. Now, notice that the 27 case mix index, index is not one that uh, an external user of financial statements would be able to calculate. Uh, uh, 
and I notice I have a, mis a typo in here for given this is what this should say. But be that it as it may, case mix indicated. The reason I give this to you here is to uh, show you just how it is calculated. And uh, many of you will know what it is. We're going to see this again in the revenue cycle uh, module in two weeks. It's the sum of each case multiplied by its case weight divided by total cases. That's just simply what case mix index is. Now notice that we adjust certain things. Notice that we adjust admissions. We also adjust patient days here. Uh, what are we doing here? We could have an interesting conversation about this if this were a live session. So I'm going to have to carry the conversation here unfortunately on my own. What we're really doing is we're calculating a single uh, unit of service in healthcare which uh, has to consist of a blend of our inpatient volume which typically is measured as admissions uh, and our outpatient volume which uh, is denoted as registration. So how do you um, create some kind of a composite uh, unit of service indicator that includes both. Well, you do that, unfortunately, through a very flawed methodology. You do it by uh, taking the ratio of gross charges to inpatient charges and multiplying by inpatient discharges. You could also here, by the way, call this inpatient admissions. Uh, and you do the same thing on the patient day side, a patient day being one patient in a bed at midnight, that's the traditional definition of a patient day. Medicare now uses another one or is trying to, but be it as it may, here we're using the traditional definition a patient day is an inpatient in a bed at midnight. And we are converting uh, the outpatient business into inpatient equivalents by this formula here, formula 28 or formula 29. Now there's a couple ways we can do that. Here are the two ways. You see it here, 28 and 29. Here have two formulas. I wish I could highlight that better for you than, and I really can't. Uh, maybe if I draw a box around it somehow, I can. See if I can. So here's two ways to do it uh, for adjusted admissions. I can do the same thing for adjusted patient days here. So there's a couple of ways to do that calculation. Pick the one that uh, suits you better uh, so you know how to how this works. Um, now the meth I said this is a very flawed method. Why is it flawed? Because we adjust outpatient uh, business to inpatient equivalents on the on the basis of the relationship of our price structures in the outpatient to the inpatient world. And, and we know that uh, those price structures can vary. In other words, we can have uh, relatively low inpatient prices if the market uh, demands that and higher outpatient prices than someone else. And thus the, the adjusted admissions or the adjusted patient days are going to calculate out differently for organizations with different price structures and are not going to be comparable uh, or very comparable. They are also not going to be comparable within the organization itself if the organization changes its price structure from year to year. So this is a flawed methodology, unfortunately, but uh, I'm happy to um, point to uh, Bill Cleverly once more, and this is a nod to the Ohio members uh, in the audience. Bill wrote an article in the May uh, HFM uh, journal uh, just a few months ago, Time to Replace Adjusted Discharges. A wonderful article, uh, one that uh, I think significantly advances this topic by replacing adjusted discharges and adjusted patient days by a far more meaningful calculation that does not depend on uh, our, our price structures. I will leave it at that and allow you to find the article either online or look it up in your magazine. You'll see here he call, he introduces something he called equivalent discharges and he defines it. But first of all, he talks about the 
old way. This is the formula you just saw in uh, on the screen a moment ago. This is the way we've always done it, and then this is the way he does it. And we don't have time right now to explore this, but I, I think this is a brilliant solution to a problem here. Okay, so is it time for another question? I think it is. So, uh, Martha, let's do polling question number six. Okay. Um, the following is an example of a capital structure ratio, return on equity, return on total assets, long-term debt to equity, total equity turnover. Okay, we've got a um, fairly large majority. Um, if you've not voted, then please go ahead and do so, so you can get your CPE credit if necessary. Uh, again, we don't look for right or wrong answers, just to vote. The majority of the, the group um, has said it is uh, C, long-term debt to um, equity. Yes, and that answer is correct. Thank you very much. I have it up here for you on the screen under capital structure ratios, long-term debt to equity. Now the others, return on equity, here it is, is a profitability ratio. Here it is, profitability ratio. Return on total assets, also a profitability ratio. And then total equity turnover, D, uh, no such thing. Okay, so that's the answer. That's uh, polling question number six. We have ten more minutes. Let's do uh, polling question number seven. And if time, we're going to do one more. Uh, we'll just play that one by ear. So, question number seven, please. Okay, that one. What is the formula for inventory turnover? Um, operating expense divided by inventory. Net revenue divided by inventory. Inventory divided divided by net revenue or inventory divided by operating expenses. One question, Christoph, while that's going on. In ratio 28, is that adjusted discharges or admissions? Oh boy, that is um, a question I, I have, I thought I knew better to answer than I do and I will uh, have to punt on that one. Okay. I'll tell you why, because uh, admissions ought to be discharged, they ought to equal each other and uh, um, and thus it shouldn't matter. But then uh, someone told me something different. I got confused. So if someone in the audience wants to enlighten me and the rest of us, whether that's admissions or discharges, please do. Okay. Uh, several people are saying we use discharges. Okay, I'm going to close. You. Close this polling question and the response, 70% uh, said net revenue divided by inventory. That is the right answer and it's not the other way around, but uh, here it is, it's, it's net operating revenue divided by inventory here, ratio number 24, here it is. Okay, so very good. Um, let's see what we have left to talk about uh, that we haven't yet talked about. And. We're going to go look at our ratios here. I think we're pretty much done. You see there's a case mix adjusted cost per patient day. So there are also case mix adjustments to, um, uh, uh, you know, F FTEs, for instance, uh, case mix adjusted FTEs per uh, occupied bed. We will look at case mix adjustment uh, uh, in our third 
uh, webinar on the revenue cycle, but you will also see this case mix adjustment show up in Bill Cleverly's article from May. So it's an important concept. It is uh, something that is not that that is not going to be asked on the exam because it's way too complicated to calculate. So I want to pause here uh, before we do the last uh, polling question and, and see if there are any. Uh, uh, please give uh, me some feedback uh, on how you felt today went and remember the question I asked you at the beginning. Why did you sign up for these webinars and how committed are you to taking the exam? So I hope what I did today so far is didn't in ordinary in ordinately scare anyone. Uh, I also hope I didn't bore anyone. Uh, I realize that uh, people come into these classes with very, very different backgrounds and skill levels. It is a finance-centric exam, even though the revenue cycle plays a significant role and accounts for probably 20% of the exam. Uh, it is a finance-centric exam. It's a, a, a so this racial stuff is about as finance centric as you can get. I hope I didn't uh, uh, turn anybody off um, uh, or overemphasize something. You know, as I said, this is maybe 15 questions out of 150. That's all it is. Any questions at this point? We've had. Uh, um, let's see. Let me. Uh, what? See if I can weed my way through them just a minute. Okay. Um, and that one, there it is. Um, several people have noted that uh, they, um, uh, if I can get my questions back here, I'm sorry, I hit the wrong button. Um, Several people said it's been a good session. Uh, it's good to get back into um, ref refresher. Uh, a little overwhelming. Um, do we need to memorize all the formulas? Well, okay, overwhelming. Yes, it is. Uh, uh, hopefully, as you study this material on your own, you it will become less overwhelming. And uh, uh, I. If you walk away with one uh, take back takeaway from today is that you cannot learn this material in one webinar. This is very different from any other webinar, uh, you know, where you you are asked very very you pitched very very easy uh, 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 balls and uh, it's easy to hit them out of the ballpark. Not so here. You saw that in these uh, polling questions there. It's not just do you do this in your organization or do you do that in your organization. This is hard stuff uh, in that sense, and you can only really learn this if you shut off the your iPad and your phone and uh, and, and learn this in in whichever way works for you. Yeah, and I, and I think part of the the other question was you know if there are multiple choice questions, how are ratio questions asked? And I think your examples of in our polling questions are how they are you know pretty much asked, uh, or it would be given data and then calculate the you know the the um, um, occupancy rate or your average daily census is so and so. So um, you know you pick. You pick the best answer. So, do you want to do the last polling question, Chris? Yeah, let's do that one. That's a okay. hard one. It's harder than what you would see on the exam, uh, but give it a shot. See, see what you can do with that question. And uh, before you show it, don't show okay. it yet, Martha, because you're going to need. Uh, 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 I'm, I'm going to have to. Uh, we're we're going to do it as follows. I'm going to show you the information, and then Martha, one, you know, after a couple minutes or so, Martha will show the question so that you can ant, a, a, enter your answers. I'm going to show it to you as a uh, as a question. The webinar system has size limits, and here's the question. And, and it, it, it does not allow us to display data like this in in the or on the screen. So please, uh, I will remain silent. I know I'm supposed to talk while 
people do, uh, where polling questions are going on. I'm going to refrain from that so as to not uh, distract you. If you want to know what the formulas are, you know where to find them in the book on page 20, 25 or so. And this would be a good example of how a question would be asked, mm -hmm. uh, presented information, and then uh, you select the, the answer for the, the, the ratio that they're being questioned yep. on. So the formulas are on page 27 and 28. Ratio 16 and ratio 20 are the two ratios. So refer to your book and then just do the calculation and then uh, I'll give you a chance to enter them in about uh, two minutes. I think I'll go ahead and launch the, the polling question, Christoph, because we're right at the yes. uh, end of time here. Let's so the calc to calculate the long-term um, debt to equity and the debt capitalization ratios, you've got the first one is 0.33 and 0.25, you've got 1.0 and 0.50, and you've got 1.25 and 0.67. Okay, we've got about five seconds left on this one. Um, I'm gonna close that poll or share. Um, about 69% indicated that it was the B 1.0 and 0 0.50. Yes, and that is the right answer. Indeed it is. Um, try it out on your own if uh, you didn't get that that answer again. This is, is as hard as this is going to get on the exam. Uh, just, uh, but, but uh, you know, the data that I showed you here is how it might be shown on the exam. And uh, you know, this is certainly a fair game question. But I, uh, to me, this is as hard as this gets. Okay, so we're at the end of our two hours. Uh, thank you for your participation. You've all stayed with it. I can see this by your attendance numbers. Uh, you've really been with it for this entire two hours. Thank you for your concentration, your answering of the questions. I uh, ask you to um, uh, email me or call. Here's my information um, on the screen. Uh, I want to hear from you. Give me feedback if you have questions. If you have time for uh, before next week, do please read the, or at least glance at the pre-reading section for uh, budgeting and forecasting. It'll make it easier for you next week. Uh, it starts on page uh, 40 in the book, and it's not a long pre-reading section at all. It's only about 15 pages. Uh, 
There's also an exercise right before that that starts on page um, 33 that allows, that's meant as a study aid in helping you learn the racial formulas. Now one last point on racial formulas is an application for your iPhone or Android phone called Quizlet which also has ratios built into them. One of the members of HFMA from the first Illinois chapter has set that up and we can talk more about that uh, next week. Thank you and uh, see you all in a week. Um, thank you, Christoph, and uh, we will uh, be posting the um, handouts. And Christoph, I think one person asked about the uh, Excel sheet uh, that's got the ratios in it, and we usually post that on our website after the fact. Um, and we can I'll do that. I'll send that. Yeah, I'll send that to uh, to Brad to post, and he's also going to post the questions and the answers to the polling questions. Today. Yes. And you can find all of that information, uh, put a link in the, the note there, but it's the tnhfma.org um, chfp-webinars and that's where all of the, the session is being recorded and you can uh, listen to it again there. So uh, if with that, again, thank you very much Christoph and everyone have a great week.